Okay, subject of the day is this monstrosity here with 60 carbons. And um, the symmetry of it is, is quite amazing. And its connection to other things that have this symmetry is also uh, very amazing. And I'm going to mention uh, a bit of that before we get into the uh, major portion of this talk, which will be the spectroscopy uh, surrounding this. And a little bit of history at the end, and in the listing that I have on the screen here, first of all, I'll point out that there are buckyballs at the University of Arkansas. I only realized this a couple of days ago. There are also buckyballs all around, especially in the wintertime when you get colds from them. These are monster buckyballs called rhinoviruses. But uh, the main thing we're interested in is, uh, first of all, making sure that we can uh, use the tools that we've already learned in this class for the octahedral symmetry and uh, do the same thing. Uh, and then some more up beyond that uh, with the icosahedral symmetry, which is the largest uh, polyhedral symmetry uh, in three-dimensional space. So without further ado, we'll be seeing uh, this list as we go through, so I will uh, continue ahead here uh, through uh, the um, other uh, links that we have. And I should mention about this particular link, almost every page has a direct to the page uh, link to some paper or uh, book. So uh, we're well linked up here, even this page right here, uh, which uh, is advertising the uh, cubic slide row uh, for the octahedral group. So the first uh, task here is uh, to, uh, first of all, get these uh, two screens more or less lined up with each other. But the main thing I do is I want to make an entree uh, to icosahedral symmetry at, uh, evident again. We've seen this before when we first talked about the octahedral symmetry, which is uh, the symmetry here of five classes of rotations. That's also going to be true of the icosahedral group. It only has five classes. And it's a group that's much bigger than uh, uh, this one. The uh, thing that makes this, um, I think, uh, interesting to solid state physicists is, first of all, that icosahedral symmetry doesn't exist in a, uh, uh, a ordinary uh, uh, crystal. Now, the quasi-crystal, that's a whole different ballgame. But in an ordinary crystal, uh, five-fold symmetry of any kind is uh, not possible. And icosahedral symmetry has a lot of five-fold symmetry uh, associated with it, not the least of which is the fact that it's connected to the uh, tetrahedral uh, connection through TH. And we mentioned this before, but if you take uh, three cards that have been carefully uh, um, cut out to have the uh, aspect ratio of 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, a large side to small size, or the 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2, uh, small size to large size. The um, idea of this is that uh, if you connect all of the 12 corners uh, of this uh, arrangement of, of, uh, of uh, three cards, four corners each, uh, you produce an icosahedron. And an icosahedron sanded off is going to be our uh, topic today. That's the uh, uh, bucky ball. So uh, the bucky ball likes to be in a solid at room temperature. And uh, uh, Buckminster Fullerite is the actual crystal uh, that bucky ball forms. A very bizarre crystal because the bucky balls are in there rotating as though they were floating uh, on some kind of lubricant until you bring the temperature down to about 100 Kelvin. Um, they remain in a rotational, a, a quantum rotation. Uh, that uh, we have yet to really uh, do much with, and I think there's a lot of futures in, in just studying that. But um, th there are other things to look at first. Now the um, three famous uh, molecules uh, that have icosahedral symmetry, and this was what uh, when I first started learning group theory from a book by uh, Morton Hammermesh, which uh, is is uh, uh, Lewis is one of Lewis's favorite. Um, 
the uh, statement that uh, occurred on the uh, finite section about uh, icosahedron group is, is that uh, there are no molecules known of icosahedral symmetry. And that's not quite true. The, this one certainly was known at that time, and then shortly thereafter, uh, C20H20 was synthesized after 17 years of sweaty work at Ohio State University by Leo Paquette. And only tiny amounts of it were made. We never got a chance to get anybody to do spectroscopy of that. So these are two. And then a whole bunch of other things uh, have icosahedral symmetry that he didn't uh, know about. But in any case, our buckyball uh, here is uh, shown inside an icosahedron with its uh, double bound, and these are things that you sh should look at in stereo on your screen. And they're set so that they're, all you have to do is bring your face close to the screen with one eye over one of the image and the other eye over the other. And eventually, you're, if you have binocular vision, now some of you may not have full binocular, but most people do, and, and the images will swim in as a 3D object, and you'll see that the writing down here is in 3D too, as well as the lines that are indicating uh, the, the, the uh, structure of the single, what I call single and double bond. That's really not a correct chemical uh, thing, but the basic idea, which I'll point to in the model, is that uh, right here is a junction between two hexagons. Next to that is a junction between a hexagon and a pentagon. I call that the single bond, and this the double bond, as though if I were to draw chemical formulas, I put two lines at the places where the hexagons join, and just one line uh, where the pentagons uh, go, go. This particular figure doesn't show that very well, but it mentions in the caption that the single bonds are, are thicker. You'll see them pointed out very carefully if you do this in 3D. Um, and that's true of a lot of other figures. Whenever you see two figures right next to each other look the same, they're not quite the same. They're designed to be uh, three-dimensional, including the one of Buckyball itself. So uh, we'll be using that a lot. Uh, uh, and and in, in fact, we're still trying to make movies in 3D of, uh, of the emotions that we're going to be talking about today. Now, as I said, uh, I was surprised to find out, indeed, there are Buckyballs at the University of Arkansas. Here's one of them. This is at the Kayamoya Greek Theater. And there's a big plaque to indicate this thing was just put together a, a, a very short time ago. It's become a national landmark. But this thing is, <laughs> there are two of these. They, 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 there was a very decrepit looking one in there uh, before. And this one has been completely redone. It's made a very beautiful bronze copper and uh, has lights inside it. And it's uh, quite spectacular. And so um, I, I point that out. Now, this uh, way of taking uh, cards and making a icosahedral symmetry, you have to realize that every one of those cards should hold a pentagon for the buckyball. And in fact, if you want to number all of the buckyball's atoms in a, a nice way, uh, I start with a vertical card here and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then I drop to the bottom of the card and finish counting 11, 12, or 15, 16, 17, and so forth. 20, that takes care of 20 atoms, you see. You're a third of the way through the 60 atoms. You have to go to the next card, and then finally the card that's horizontal, and you'll finally end up uh, at 60. So uh, that's one way, very quickly, to program something that has a picture with buckyball in it, and then you can adjust the size of the pentagon uh, according to whatever the bonding is, and the single and double bonds are not equal in length, not quite, according to the best x-ray uh, information that we have uh, so far. So th this is some interesting points here. Now, where are most of the icosahedral symmetries found? This kind of thing. And this is not nice. This is a, a cause, one of many, of the common cold. It's a virus. It's a rhinovirus. Rhino means nose. You have literally millions of them in your nose waiting to take advantage of you uh, in, in uh, situations where mucus floats. 
is just an image of uh, uh, like uh, this is this a is a simulation simulation of the and the cover of science magazine uh, was taken uh, and, the, and this was a breakthrough science year. Now, buckyball is is a very small thing. It, it, it's about well, if you count uh, everything outside of it, 17 uh, uh, angstroms. This is 20 angstroms right here. So buckyball is that big. Okay, mm -hmm. this is the Death Star compared to buckyball. So when you say 17 angstroms, like if you imagine this to be a sphere, the yeah. diameter is 17 angstroms. The whole diameter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it would sit down there like that. Okay. Yeah, it gives you an idea how big. The uh, viruses. You know, this is a big molecule, but this is a bigger one. <laughs> right. Now, what, what, what does it need to have icosahedral symmetry for? Well, it's the highest symmetry in three-dimensional space, and it needs that because it has to come up to a cell wall and touch it, and every time it touches, be in a position to inject its RNA. Uh, into the uh, cell that it's going to uh, defeat. Because they use the, the cell's uh, DNA machinery to reproduce these things. And so the cell will then proceed to fill up with these things until it bursts. Then a whole bunch of these things go off and give you a common cold or a pneumonia or there are a bunch of diseases that have very nice icosahedral shape. Polio is one of them. It has a very uh, smooth and smaller uh, thing. Uh, HIV, apparently, uh, immunodeficiency uh, virus, is also, I think, having a uh, symmetry like this. So icosahedral symmetry is not all good. <laughs> it's very powerful. Nature is making use of it. And Hammermesh was wrong. <laughs> There are a lot of things with that causal symmetry that nature is providing us. So, um, the slide rules that we used in the octahedral uh, descriptions of things, uh, the, particularly uh, the one that's on this slide right here, and that's just for the O group. Uh, it needs to be filled in to make the OH group. The same thing uh, for the thing that's at the end of the uh, last slide, uh, last uh, screen there, uh, is an icosahedron uh, that's um, made. Uh, with all of IH, that's the I cross the inversion. So um, here's the dodecahedron, uh, and now these things are available only uh, uh, in the program that does the um, pictures of vibrations, which is uh, DC is busily uh, getting into good shape now. Uh, this isn't quite finished. There should be uh, the blanks here should be filled with, like this one, uh, a reflection operator. And really, we should have this thing in the room to hold, look at. If you're going to take a cross product, this is a really good way to do it. If you're going to make cosets, uh, it's also a good way to do it. And, um, there's a lot of advantages to this particular way of taking products, uh, which we're going to be exploring uh, as we get further and further into this uh, business of the buckyball uh, spectroscopy. Okay, so that aside, uh, the other way to handle it is to just look at, and this is uh, linked to uh, Dave Weeks and my paper uh, in general chemical physics in which uh, all of the uh, classes of the uh, buckyball, except the unit class is not shown, but that's just do nothing. So here are four classes that do something, and uh, this class right here is the one that has the five-fold rotations. Uh, this class right here is the one that has the three-fold, 120-degree rotations. And you've got to realize that, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I mispointed. This is the 120-degree class down. There are two classes involving five-fold rotations, one of them plus or minus 72 degrees. Call that the 1, 5, and 4, 5 class. Then the 2 mod 5 and the 3 mod 5 class, uh, consisting of 144 uh, degree rotations are the others. And again, these are uh, nice pictures for looking at in stereo in which you'll see uh, the arrangement of the rotation operators. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going from, uh, <coughs> from uh, let's see right here, you can see a little numbers on there uh, in each of these uh, uh, five-fold rotations. Uh, there are uh, six, uh, six uh, two-sided uh, operations, that's 12 altogether uh, operations, and 12 times 5 is 60, 
And remember that you have to multiply uh, the order of the class times the number of elements in, in the class to get the order of the group. And then there's a, that one's very similar to this one. And then these are the different one, 180 degrees uh, you, you see uh, uh, down here. Now this is, the, this is the one that's quite large. It has 20 of each of those uh, operations there. 20 times 3 is 60. Uh, here we've got uh, uh, <coughs> here uh, actually 30 uh, lines. 30 times 2, two two-fold symmetry is 60 as well. So that's the class structure. This is quite analogous to the class structure of the octahedron. And I left the thing up there so we can make that comparison. Now, um, this is a group table, an actual multiplication table, 60 by 60. And it's in the Journal of Chemical Physics. This particular link will lead you right to it. Unfortunately, um, it takes up two pages, which are not on the same opening. You have to turn the page to get the other half. This is them put together. You see a little seam here where I uh, stuck it together uh, for the use in um, whatever. Uh, if you just like to use tables, this is the thing to do it. And it's broken into classes. First, there's the identity class up there. Then there's the 72-degree uh, the class, and then the 144-degree class uh, right there, and then the 120-degree class, that's the, uh, the, the, the biggest one, uh, and then finally the 180-degree class uh, right there. So it's all nicely broken up and the lines are separating them. And uh, TC is trying to make it so that we can do this in the new way, and that is to put the inverse of the elements on one edge and, and, uh, and the regular elements across the top, or vice versa. That's the way you make this into a Hamiltonian matrix for a regular representation, and we have, uh, I think, some gains to do that. Anyway, this is just a list of the uh, uh, icosahedral I operations. That's I without the reflections, okay, and that uh, consists of one, two, three, four classes that do something, and one more that does nothing, the identity class. And again, this is something you can look up in that paper. Now, uh, the full icosahedral group is this, right here, this, plus this, okay, again, four more things. It takes more space to specify that an inversion uh, operation times this guy right here is what this one is. So the eightas represent uh, threefold rotations that have been obtained uh, after, uh, with an inversion attached. Uh, these are the threefold rotations without the inver inversion attached. And we're doing the same thing with the 72 degree uh, operations and then the 144 degree operations uh, that we're doing for the 130, uh, 120 threefold. Uh, operations and finally here are all those 180 degree rotations all 15 of them okay uh, they're the things we call sigmas that's a reflection a mirror plane reflection same notation as it is for the OH uh, symmetry there so uh, this is a complete list of the uh, full uh, operations both proper and improper operations proper being determinant plus one, uh, this one determinant minus one. So these are the uh, operations you can't do in the real world without destroying the object uh, that you're doing it to by either inverting it or reflecting it. So um, one other thing that I want to point out that's uh, a good since we have spent some time looking at permutation groups, we never got to S5. S4 was what we needed to uh, take care of the O group, the octahedral group, but it also took care of the TD tetrahedral diagonal group. Uh, they, they were all, all three of those are isomorphic. Well, S5 is not isomorphic uh, to uh, icosahedral group, but it's almost that way. The even permutations of S5, which is called A5, uh, the alternating five group is the full mathematical name, I guess, for it. Uh, even permutation group A5, that's half of S5, uh, is the icosahedral group. And uh, uh, we'll see, uh, here's a picture of the character table for S5. Here is another way to look 
at the icosahedral uh, symmetry. Here are all of those 144 degree rotations. Here are the 72 degree rotations, each labeled by a permutation that moves the numbers on this particular icosahedron, which has one, two, three, four, five written down on uh, every face has a number, but there are uh, there are five things, so there are really six ways to lay down uh, the one, two, three, four, five uh, on the icosahedron, which maps perfectly uh, with the permutations uh, of A5, that is the even permutations. Remember, the even permutations are the permutations that have odd cycles, an, an odd number of odd cycles. Okay, so, uh, for example, uh, two bicycles, that's even. Uh, one tricycle, that's even. And then one cinco cycle, or whatever you want to call a, a pentacycle. Okay, one pentacycle, pentacycle is an even permutation. So, S5 has uh, the green elements here are the subgroup, a half of the S5 that is even. And then the odds are indicated by red. And we'll come back and make some connections, which really are very close to the icosahedron group. The only representation here that's hiding uh, representations of the icosahedral group is this one. Th this, this, and this one right here has two threes in it. And then the four and the five, and there's another four and the five that serve the flip of the, this four and the five. Those are already irreducible representations of the icosahedron. It's just this one that has two threes in it. And of course there's the identity. And then there's the anti-identity, the uh, pseudo-scalar uh, there uh, for the per uh, permutations. We'll come back to that. And here's lots of links down here to uh, this. Here's another way to look at it using Hamilton's turns. Okay, every one of these turns uh, could be computed uh, its product just by getting the vectors to come together and make a sum and then you look at what the sum is. But you can also just read the numbers and know if you do permutations faster than you do vector sums. Uh, you have two ways to get the group products of the icosahedron group sitting there on the same sheet of paper. Which is, I, I guess, worth something. But n n uh, maybe not a whole lot. Anyway, there's a link to that one as well if you want to study more about it. And these are the actual paths uh, that are uh, uh, carrying the Hamilton uh, uh, turns, uh, and all of this is in the, that funny paper called the Double Group Theory on the Half Shell. It's about SU2, basically. So, um, the next thing we want to do is actually some physics. So from here on, we're talking physics and using the math uh, that comes out of this stuff above it. Uh, Cartesian coordination of the carbon atoms. In other words, we're going to go at this the same way we went at SF6. And there's another 3D picture there showing uh, where uh, are all of the uh, basic uh, elements uh, that, uh, in other words, if you're going to make a group theory slider, you could do it this way. It's not terribly great. But in any case, it's showing uh, that every one of the 60 operations of the uh, C60 group has its own carbon atom. So um, basically we're looking at the standard stitching of a soccer ball. And some people uh, <clears throat> wanted to call um, uh, buckyball furine, I guess, because football uh, in Europe means uh, soccer. And soccer is a spherical ball with icosahedral symmetry more often than not. In any case, uh, this is a good one to use a 3D uh, a capability of your brain uh, to see where everything is uh, and the uh, group of uh, I, just I, not I, H. Uh, you have to put uh, inversions on all of these in order to finish the I, H. But anyway, this is the beginning. Remember I said there's a pentagon sitting on top of cards. This is basically the pentagon and we've got one uh, axis uh, that we call A that sticks out of this thing and doesn't look quite right until you see it in the 3D. And then you've got every other atom has a radial vector. Let's say this is the top uh, uh, pentagon of a, a buckyball that comes way down here. 
and uh, so those are uh, radii through the center of buckyball, and those are the things that are actually being labeled by the group elements uh, of the thing. But once you've labeled the uh, point uh, by a particular operation, say R big R one squared is that guy right there. There are two more coordinates to go with it, and that means that you've got to build on this edge uh, to uh, what we call the B part of the coordinate system. So there's the A part of the coordinate system and the B part of the coordinate system. Uh, the correct term for that if you're doing solid state physics is this is the, an element of the A orbit and orbit means you go around to all the things that are labeled A and uh, put wave functions on them or whatever and then you go around and there are twice as many of uh, things in the B orbit. We're going to enumerate all of that fairly shortly here. Uh, and, and you go around to all of the places that are labeled with B and a particular uh, element that, uh, uh, that it. Now this one right here would just be labeled by whatever this element just happens to be the identity, but this one would be labeled here and then by a reflection through a plane perpendicular to it. So that's the way the group theory is going to be uh, done uh, when we go to project the eigenmodes uh, from this collection of 60, but it's more than 60, it's 60 plus, and then 2 times 60, that's 180 uh, dimensions of, of freedom, degrees of freedom. 60 times 3 uh, degrees of freedom uh, have to be accounted uh, for uh, plus or minus, well, minus some rotation and translation, we'll get to that. Uh, we have to do that. So anyway, here are the three, the three dimensional uh, coordinate system. But again, this is a drawing to be seen in stereo. And when you see it in stereo, you see all of these three, these three uh, x, y, z coordinates for all 60 uh, of these uh, 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 points that, uh, that are origins for a local coordinate system of the Bucky Ball and um, of a particular atom of the Bucky Ball. So all 180 degrees of freedom there's a degree of freedom, there's another one, there's another, and of course this main guy right here has some darkly uh, lined uh, versions of the triad. The orth orthonormal triad is the proper word uh, for uh, 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 the uh, coordinate systems that uh, are sitting on this globe. And here uh, is the unit cell. Uh, you're thinking of this thing as a lattice. This is a unit cell with the particular springs that we're going to use uh, to set up the uh, K matrix, the spring matrix, uh, the Hamiltonian, if you will, uh, for this um, uh, molecule. Again, this is in stereo, and we're going to connect it to those dark lines uh, right there. Uh, another way to look at that thing is uh, this, and there's the uh, a typical distortion of the tri of this uh, uh, unit cell. Uh, the unit cell is repeated in there and then uh, a particular uh, distortion and it's labeled by uh, basically difference vectors uh, that belong to a particular group element. And that's the way the arithmetic for this uh, is done. And again, it's something you have to really see in three dimensions uh, to um, completely uh, help us. Anyway, this is a complete set of the uh, basic force matrix that comes out of this thing using those uh, parameters. And the parameters that uh, I uh, indicated here is the P's are the nearest neighbor um, um, <coughs> spring uh, uh, constants and um, the uh, eta's and the H's and whatnot are uh, spring constants for, uh, first of all, the P's uh, uh, go with hexagonal uh, double bonds and then the H's go with a single bond. So you have a different spring constant on those, uh, th on those thin lines in the picture that we uh, showed uh, when, uh, of, the, of the 3D buckyball. So right here uh, we're looking at um, the, uh, and I think I'm actually wrong about that, this is the hexagonal boundary, H for hexagon, so that's a hexagon meeting another hexagon. This is a pentagon meeting a hexagon. And so uh, there's a hexagon waiting down here, but this is a pentagon on this side. 
and there's another one on this side. So those are all P's, uh, the ones associated with the Pentagon, and then the H's are the ones that actually connect to hexagon. So this is allowing for the springs to be different. And it turns out they're not that different, so it's, it's in a sense some uh, wasted effort. But if you're going to be really precise, you would uh, uh, certainly take that into account. And of course, the thing we have to discuss here is how precise is this model? And the answer is, it's not that great. Uh, uh, it can be improved. And uh, that's what we plan to do. Okay, we do some more funny techniques to make, make this better. Okay, so anyway. Um, now, the actual group theory. And we've got characters and irreducible representations. And we're going to uh, develop all of them, not with the character table directly. We're just going to appeal uh, to the uh, induced representations uh, that go with this. So subduced, induced, that whole business of, of relating, that's correlating, uh, the entire uh, buckyball group to its subgroups, uh, both the uh, uh, C5V, basically, or just C5, that's what you get if you play around uh, the face of a pentagon, or the hexagon, that's a threefold structure. Now, a hexagon normally would be D6, but remember, uh, this isn't a perfect hexagon. It's only got C3 symmetry. So we will be dealing with that correlation to the uh, subgroup of 120 degree rotations. And then we've got to look at the, you get to take a good look at the icosahedral irreducible representations. Uh, they, they are, they are um, I think, better understood by <coughs> appealing to the Pentagon. I mean, appealing to the uh, permutations of five things. So, uh, let's do that now. This is um, the actual character table right here for I, with its five classes and five representations. So this isn't that much different from the octahedral uh, uh, case. And speaking of which, I think I want to move ahead now on this uh, thing, keep these uh, screens in sync so we can make some comparisons. So um, we are now in a position uh, to um, see how the representations of S5 go with A5, which is right here. So alternating group, that's the uh, group that consists of the even operations in S5 and excludes the odd operations, the other half of this group, you might say. Um, exactly half divides that group in half. It's 120, which is 5 factorial. 60 of them are even in playing this character table right here. And the only thing that uh, really stands out is that this six here breaks into these two threes. One of them, uh, when the inversion uh, symmetry is accounted for, one of them, that dark blue, uh, is the polar vector, and this is the axial vector uh, of the uh, irreducible set. Then there's a scalar, but there's no pseudo-scalar, you see, until you take inversion into account and make the group twice as big, then there's your pseudo-scalar right there. It's all ones still for these elements, but then it's all minuses for the odd. Now it's odd in terms of having an inversion. So uh, inversion now, the geometry of the inversion symmetry, including the reflections, the 120 degree rotation inversions, the 72 and 444 rotation inversions, those are hard to visualize. This one, not so much, because it's just a mirror plane reflection. But these things are glide plane screw axes, or all kinds, you give them all kinds of crazy names, are uh, hard to visualize, harder to visualize than uh, most of the elements uh, here. But here's the big difference right here. The uh, numbers that appear in the irreducible representations and in the character are, uh, depending on your f uh, feeling about number theory, are nesting numbers or nice numbers. This is uh, sometimes called the most irrational number. And that's because continued fractions, uh, approximations uh, for this uh, number uh, take incredible lengths to get, uh, say, five figure uh, precision. Whereas most irrational numbers like e or pi 
uh, you get a, a five or six figure precision with just uh, two steps in a continued fraction. This one is the worst continued fraction you can have. A continued fraction is 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1, all 1's. And that's what makes it, uh, its conversions terrible. So uh, th this is a nasty number. But all the other numbers are pretty nice. They're all integers, just like a, 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 an octahedral or the S5 uh, character table. S5, remember, S4 is the same as the octahedron, and it's the same as the TD, tetrahedral diagonal group. Isomorphic, same thing. This one has this bizarre thing where we have to break the six down to these two, and then the golden ratios show up. But if you put them back together again, then you get integers. Okay. So, because of those two uh, Gs, those golden guys in there, uh, the irreducible representations for this group, as you will see, are, are really terrible numbers. Terrible in the sense that you have to play with radicals all the time. Octahedron is nice. You can find a, a basis in which it was all ones, minus ones, and zeros, right? That's pretty cool when you can do that. You don't get to do that here. At least not the way it's normally done. I can see of ways to get that to happen, but you pay for it. Okay, now this is what we're really after. We're after how the icosahedral group, I mean the full icosahedral, this guy right here, IH, with G's and U's, inversion parity, positive inversion parity, negative. Uh, how they behave when reduced to a very simple two-degree, two two-order two group, the vertical reflections, the sigmas. We're just going to keep the sigmas on that table. The last column is the only thing that's being uh, looked at here. And just one of those is, is still a symmetry. Okay. So what happens uh, to uh, even an odd parity, reflection parity, okay? And it's, it's pretty easy uh, uh, to uh, use this table to derive the correlations uh, that, that occur. Then we're going to use that to set our coordinates up. This is going to basically be the A and the B um, orbits of the coordinates that we use. But we're also going to be interested later on in uh, this guy right here, this is C2H. That's a, like a D2-like group uh, consisting of A1, A2, B1, and B2. Remember, back and forth, always the same. And then one meant even, two meant odd. Uh, same idea. Or in C5V, there's the C5V uh, representation. It only has four classes. This is just the uh, pyramid group with five-sided pyramid. Okay. Uh, and it has vertical reflections, uh, and then it has uh, two representations, just like the, the D6 group had, E1 and E2, sort of vector and tensor, and then it has scalar and pseudoscalar, okay? So, how does this giant icosahedral group break down uh, when it is res restricted to the symmetry of the um, pyramid? That is uh, kind of like putting an electric field on the thing. So T1G here splits into a singlet and a doublet. This is a three-dimensional guy. He's going to split into a singlet and a doublet uh, there. This one's going to do a similar thing. It'll be this doublet instead, but the same singlet. Okay. Then there's these four-dimensional and five-dimensional representations, you see. And those four and five, uh, you see, are uh, showing up uh, over on the uh, S5 table. Okay, and let me use a high frequency to, to uh, designate that. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, four and the five representations, okay, there's one here and there's one here that's four, and then the five and the five are right next door to the six, okay. Th those guys right there uh, are, are showing up right in place here. They have uh, essentially the same matrices with respect to at least the subgroup IH that they had over here uh, for the supergroup S5 that they come from. So uh, it's those guys that do funny things. This one right here is four dimensional. It's going to split into two plus two. This is five dimensional. It's going to split into these are singlets, so it has to be three plus two. It has to add up to five. Just like these had to add up to three for that. And this one had to, of course, be one. And then it had to happen again in slightly different ways. This is three and two. This is two and three. 
it's really quite a beautiful uh, symmetry uh, stuff that's happening here that you don't see in the octahedral. The octahedral uh, is not quite as advanced as the symmetry. And then as you go to the higher subgroups, you see similar uh, uh, things happening. Now for future reference, uh, and this is something, again, that's linked, uh, uh, was on the previous page linked, you can go and look at the correlation tables for just I and just C2, just the uh, uh, rotations by 180 degrees. So I'm confining myself to one of those, what happens to the group, okay? Well, the three-dimensional one splits into one, two, just very similar to that one up there. And this one into two plus two, and this one into three plus two. The uh, C3 does a slightly different act here, because you have zero mod three, one mod three, and two mod three. Now you have three things for them to go into. And these guys all go in and we almost get out of this thing without a two. You see, the twos are the uh, things that means you haven't completely labeled the uh, correlation uh, here. But uh, again, five things is one plus two plus two. Four things is two plus one plus one. And these are the uh, two kinds of vectors. So th that's, we're going to make use of these for studying the clusters, the rotational clusters. And finally, there's a C5 subgroup. And it breaks down with all ones. Okay, just like, uh, well, this particular example over here, uh, C5V, uh, uh, breaks down with all ones. Okay, so the, there's a couple of extra doubles there that mean you're not completely labeling with this subgroup chain uh, that uh, that uh, correlation refers to. So these are the numbers that we're going to use to build uh, the normal modes, basically, of this uh, object. Okay, um, see if there's anything else here. Now I told you that the numbers of a typical irreducible representation are some ugly fellows, okay? Who's omega, okay? This is a table of all the numbers that you've got, you need if you're going to carry infinite precision uh, in this. Well, omega's not so bad. Omega's just one over the square root of five, okay? so. If, if they're all like that, that would be great, but they aren't, okay? Any one of these letters here goes to something like this. How do you like the D? The D only shows up in a few places, here and here, okay? There and there. This is the four-dimensional representation. Here's the five-dimensional representation. Uh, it doesn't seem to have much use for D. And there's a lot of symmetry of number theory that goes into uh, this particular group. This is not trivial. The octahedral stuff was simple by comparison, as you can see. But D is 7 minus 4 times, and here's the golden ratio, divided by 20. And if it's isn't bad enough, you've got to take the square root of that. These are called surds in, in arithmetic, right? Quadratic surds, when you have a, a, a square root of something already has square, square roots, right? And you can make jokes about it being absurd as well. <laughs> this is a pretty imposing arithmetic sitting here, right? If you have to do uh, calculations by hand with a group this big, you think twice. <laughs> it's amazing what people were able to do um, before this. So, and this is, was Dave Week's idea, just to tabulate how bad the arithmetic is uh, for the irreducible representations. And we're just looking at the 120s right here, and then the 180s right here. Just one particular one, I11, and this is R1, okay? So this gives you a feeling for, uh, you know, wh why you would like to do this on a computer. And all of, of the uh, calculations that we did, I, I set up a program to do SF6 on the, uh, you remember the Macintosh that looked like a fire plug? The very first one? 1984 actually, right? It was $1,600 or something for this, this terrible computer, but compared to what you had, this was an amazing computer. What was the RAM back then? In 128K. Wow. <laughs> K. <laughs> yeah, we did all the calculations on, 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 on the fire plug. It was actually a fire plug SE, which had a little more than that. What, what's that 256, I think. <laughs> 
was it um, uh, manufactured after uh, the invention of DRAM in early 80s? Intel early 80s. Yeah, uh, Intel came up with DRAM, yeah. uh, invented DRAM. And, uh, Before DRAM. Well, there was something Sing called Lisa. Okay. Lisa was like $8,000, okay, and of course that didn't sell at all. Only Halbius bought that thing. And it, it was the final Mac, it's just it was a little bigger and it was kind of clunky and, and 8,000, okay. Sure. Then in 84 they had this great, you remember the screen where it showed somebody throwing a hammer at a giant screen, a bunch of, 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 uh, of goons sitting in a room, right? Marketing, yeah. And this was the breaking of the, of the um, of the PC, the PC uh, sort of um, rigid way of doing computing uh, down. The rectangular graphic pixel is what I, I hated about that. And this had a square pixel, so we were, we were very happy to so get a square pixel. Back then, what program did you use to uh, solve your problems at the Hunter using the uh, The, the original, Mac? My original problem for, program for the SF6 was done in BASIC. And that was the only language that was available. Then Fortran came along. Boy, that was <laughs> that was a real mess. It was made by Microsoft, and they were terrible programmers. And they left bugs everywhere. So oh, you get you know almost gosh. halfway through your thing, and it would just crash completely. Yeah. You debug line by line, right line, right line, right line. No, it's the only way to you debug. You have bugs in a sense. You would get up. You would end up uh, getting numerical errors. Is that working? No, uh, I know of no cases where it was actually the fault of the machine. It was a fault programmer. Okay. You know, the co the compiler, okay. right? The, the people that write the compiler is a fault of them. They were very careless because they were rushing to get the thing out uh, madly. Okay, so here's the deal. Here is a, a typical um, thing, and we would like to see what irreducible representations of I H uh, are made just with the radial motions, the A orbit. Forget the guys that are perpendicular to that for the moment, but uh, just the A orbit, okay? A induced to the whole group, okay? That's AG plus T1G, one of them, plus one of these, T3G, okay? And then uh, the fourfold guy gets thrown in there twice, so He's bigger and he's more often, and this one is amazing, this is five dimensions thrown in there three times, okay, but we're only half done, okay. Now we have to have, well, uh, this looks like a typo error right here, yeah. I should have none of those, that should be a zero, and then I should have two of these, and two of these, and two of these, and two of those. That will be 60 levels, okay. You if you add all the dimensions up there and don't add that guy in there, you get 60 uh, from that. Then the next stop here is the B orbit, where I'm going to have, as you can see here, uh, let's see if I've uh, done this right. Um, <clears throat> looks like I've made a mistake there, too. I should have no AG there, but I should have, uh, am, I, am I looking at this right? Uh, something weird here. Um, the B orbits uh, seem to have... Uh, Oh, they did break on the end, too. I'm trying to figure out what it is uh, that I did here. T1U is off. Yeah. Uh, huh. That's weird. I thought I'd looked at this fairly carefully, but it's clear that I did not. Um, and then I totaled them up here to get 180 levels, which I did. And I'm trying to figure out what it is. Uh, that's that right. sum is correct. Yeah, the sum is, is definitely right. I'm just figuring out how I broke it down into 0, 1, uh, I, H. Obviously, See, this comes from another um, uh, thing. Let me go ahead here. Yeah, yeah I, zero I, is I put the wrong uh, correlation table uh, for this one. Okay, that, that one's the one. If I'm going to be doing a 0, 1, I, H, that has to be uh, a, a, a correlation table corresponding to the um, the, uh, let's see if I've got them all here. I, hmm. um, where am that I? That looks true too, your CV. Yeah, I mean, the, the <clears throat> yeah, I, huh. Well, I'm going to have to go back and look at what happened there. I, 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 I don't know uh, how I got that uh, goofed up there, but I certainly did. 
just uh, rig it back in. But anyway, this this when they when you add them all together, you get th these 180 levels, which are the ones that we need to make um, things. This is the A plus B, and then it's p plus this. This is the A here. Presumably, that's the the B. Uh, so you end up here with um, all of these except for uh, T1G, that's a rotation, so I only have three of those. And then uh, one less of the T1Us, that's the translation. Remember how we did this for SF6? So then I end up with four T1Us. And that's essentially what uh, you see here. You see uh, uh, right here a 4x4 four four matrix corresponding to the T1Us. Uh, I'm sorry, T1Gs. Let's see what the T1Gs are doing. Right, you got three uh, by three, uh, and um, uh, that's one of them. Zero. That, that one right there. Huh. It's like somebody went in and huh, either scrambled my gr brain or scrambled the um, the uh, uh, calculations here uh, for this. These are all U's uh, over here. And these are all G's mm -hmm. over here. The biggest one here is this one right here. H uh, it appears eight times. Okay, so we have eight dimensions here uh, to diagonalize. And um, then uh, there's seven H's over here. So each time you're diagonalizing, you're taking care of seven times five levels uh, just by diagonalizing one matrix. And that's the way symmetry works. So um, you can see how we broke the problem down so it could be done on a little uh, fire plug Macintosh uh, just to uh, get uh, the eigenstates for a matrix. It's 180 by 180 to start with. Mm -hmm. So that, that was uh, you know, the group theory and the Macintosh saved this project <laughs> for sure. And uh, uh, that um, we were the first actually to do a correct calculation of the uh, modes. There was one other guy um, named Stanton that had done a calculation in a hurry, but it had, was riddled with errors, so uh, that um, uh, took away from uh, that particular work. Okay, so uh, here are uh, the ones you can actually see in the spectrum. And um, there are 10 Raman active things, but um, the uh, Infrared active are all T1Us, and there's only a 4x4, four four, um, if you throw the translation away, um, four genuine vibrations uh, that are, are coming out of this with frequencies 4, 78, and 6. So two guys that are close together, and then further up, uh, two more that are uh, within about 400 uh, wave numbers. That's 400 waves per centimeter, 400 Kaiser, to use the correct notation uh, for a spectroscope in infrared frequencies. So um, these are the ones that uh, led to its discovery finally. Uh, but um, the Ramans, there's uh, 10 of those guys. And two of them are A1Gs, which means they're really Raman active. The others, uh, maybe not so much. Uh, the HGs, yeah, they're Raman active in principle, but do they really have a high polarizability? Well, that depends on the modes themselves. And a couple of them don't, so it was hard to find the Raman modes. We'll talk a little bit about the history of all this spectroscopy uh, later. But in any case, here are eight Raman active HGs. So the polarizability tensor um, uh, uh, is married to the representation basis HG, uh, and uh, that that makes sense. And then the AG uh, that turns out to be the most because whenever a molecule breathes like an A1G, symmetric in all directions, it becomes bigger. So that when an electric field comes by, the induced dipole moment is higher. And that causes radiation into the Raman receiver. That's the uh, physics of Raman effect in a, a, a sort of a hand-waving nutshell. Okay, now David thought it was a good idea to check out how you would uh, things would vary.
Third way, we should have done this first. Within two days, the whole world believed that Buckyball existed. The whole, it just shifted. Everybody said, yep, that's it. All the other evidence, nah. But they don't understand spectroscopy, mostly. You know, the astronomers uh, take astro uh, uh, spectroscopy very seriously. But most chemists are sort of second, second flavor. NMR is the way they, they like to look at things. And so when it happened, one line from something like that, wow, that's a dead giveaway. And you see, if it hadn't been for that 1% of carbon-13, you wouldn't have that one line, right? So it had to be an impure buckyball that was making the NMR. Otherwise, you don't get anything. So, you know, this is an amazing story, I, as I say. I would leave this thought with you. May the Bucky Lamp <laughs> light your way, always. Okay, we've talked enough. We hope I hope you can use some of this stuff. Thanks, Arch. <laughs>